Hello and welcome to another Tales of Tormented, Tormented Space. Space. Yes, <laughs> deep as we are in, in Season 4 and after we've just done a few uh, catch-up readings from Farscape magazines, I thought it was about time we dig back into the what's, what's affectionately called filler, episode filler right. stories. Yes, firma, firma score stories. Well, uh, yes, from Terra Firma, mm-hmm. uh, which you now know why I it's know. named yes. that, because the previous one was Kansas, <laughs> so Terra Firma comes after. Oh, that means that if this one ever goes down, then it'll have to be replaced by twice shy Farscape.com. That'll be I mean, weird. This was, yes, I suppose. Yeah. Well, hmm. I'm sure we can come up with something else clever, but I mean, there's still a lot of. Well, no, not us. Okay. Then. I mean, <laughs> fan, other fans, uh, yes, Farscape exactly. fanboys, especially, specifically the uh, ones uh, who are uh, inclined towards fanfic writing. I mean, I can't imagine there's a lot of new stuff being posted there. Okay, now I immediately want to see how much new stuff has been posted there. I don't know. I mean, I remember looking on, um, you know, sites like Archive of Our Own and Fanfiction.net, and there were still, like, contemporary fix being written. I wonder if that's also the case with Terra Firma. But that's not the case for this story in this case, because this was actually published just after Bringing Home the Beacon came out. Yes. So I made a little selection. As usual, I'll go through the selection and see, okay, this one's too long, this one's too... uh, Published so late that it might risk spoilers for later in the series. Right, yes, I get that. And I found one that I thought was uh, was really interesting because it, 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 it deals with a lot of the emotions that people should be feeling at the end of Bringing Home the Beacon, Mm -hmm. which I think is really valid and interesting because Bringing Home the Beacon ended with, as I've predicted, from the very beginning, Aaron turning out to actually be just a bunch of gunk and tubes and pipes and snakes. <laughs> I think I said snakes or worms or something. But yes, <laughs> snips and snails and puppy dog tails. <laughs> well, the real Aaron, of course, she's been replaced by a bioloid and the real one has been kidnapped. And then how do people feel about that? Yes. So the story is called My Brother's Keeper. It's rated G and it was written by Aaron Crichton. I think we've read uh, Aaron it Crichton's sounds familiar, yes. stories before. 11,733 posts at the time of light reading. Oh, wow. Wait for the we it does turn. A wheel, sorry. Wheel, wait. <laughs> <laughs> That's a very different kind of fan fiction. Anyway, this one. My Brother's Keeper. Originally published... Now, what do you think that is? 11th of May 2003 or... 5th of November, 2003. Remember? remember. Uh, this is no, I mean, I'm assuming it's going to be an American site, so it's probably 5th of November. Okay, there we go. John Dargo and one missing ex-peacekeeper. Shortly after BHT, BHTB, mm-hmm. bringing home the beacon, the usual uh, disclaimers, and thanks to bunnies, even if you did make me seriously doubt myself, the story is better for your input. Oh, that's nice. I like it when, when, when writers, like... Use those credits to like, thank their, their beta readers right, and yes. editors. All right, my brother's keeper. Mm. Crichton completely lost it at dinner. Frelnik, Dargo muttered under his breath, hauling the human out to the corridor before he could do any more damage. Not that Dargo had expected Crichton to eat dinner, of course. Not with that thing that wasn't Aaron lying in Sokozu's lab with half its relic face blown off. And the real Aaron in the hands of the Scarrants, who were probably torturing her even now. Everyone on Moya knew John was beating himself up over what had happened to the woman he loved, even if they were supposed to have been Splitsville, as John described it. <laughs> of course, yeah, because uh, Dargo doesn't know this. Either. Oh, yeah, yes. yeah, yeah. The heart knew no logic, only that he loved, no matter the pain inflicted. Ah, Frell. Dargo understood that all too well. He sure does. But John was driving Pilot to distraction, demanding ever deeper searches of Moya's databases and logs, trying to trace the one pathetic lead they had, someplace called Katratzi. And the Luxon had decided to give the poor creature some peace. Quite apart from Crichton's badgering, Pilot too loved Aaron. So Dargo had dragged the human into the centre chamber and sat him down at the table along with the rest of Moya's current occupants, Gianna, Rigel, Naranti, Scorpius and Sokozu. Chana had said John needed more time alone, but once Dargo got a good look at John in the light of the central chamber, he was glad he hadn't left his friend on his own. In the short time since they'd realised that Aaron was lost, John's face had picked up a gaunt, lost look. Mm. His blue eyes were too bright, almost feverish, and they didn't seem to see anyone who was actually there in the room. You look like Dren, Dargo announced. Nice. Crichton ignored the remark and everything everyone else said. 
and refused to take any of the food they offered him. When Gianna put some on his plate anyway, Crichton muttered, no thanks, and shoved the plate toward the centre of the table. To Dargo's disgust, John had somehow managed to bring a handheld data screen along with him, and he turned his attention to the device, no doubt looking for a reference to this mysterious place Sikozu had heard the Scarens mention, assuming she wasn't making it up. The room settled into near silence. Chana kept cajoling, and Rigel complained as usual about Noranti's cooking, but everyone else <laughs> held their peace, and the only sounds were those of dishes being passed and utensils scraping against pans and plates. Well, I, Rigel, this is after he just begged, begged Noranti to please cook something, <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, trust him to turn it around. Dargo loaded his own plate with rangpur chowder and grolak, which certainly would have been crispier if Chiana had made it, oh yeah, and tried to decide whether he would be risking a display of the human's temper if he pushed a little harder about the food. I love how caring he is mm. toward Crichton, really focusing they on... They are buzz. Yeah. The question was complicated by the fact that the Luxon had been somewhat distant from the ex-peacekeeper since her return, and he suspected that Crichton, when he finally remembered that, would, in his present state... Take that as evidence that Dargo wasn't upset by what had happened to her, which wasn't true at all. He resented the pain Aaron caused John without even trying, but he respected her as a warrior and a shipmate, and he didn't wish a scar in captivity on anyone, especially a pregnant woman. But ah, oh, it was more than that. He had to admit Aaron was family, even if they worried to death. Uh, uh, pardon me. Edit, edit, edit. Even if they were estranged just now and he was worried to death about her. In the end, he sighed and said nothing. Even Chana finally gave up on her attempts at cajoling Crichton, though obviously John's misery was causing her considerable distress, and she kept sneaking looks at him that the human never noticed. Dargo was a little surprised that Rigel didn't simply imperiously order the human to pull himself together, but the toad seemed to be somewhat distressed by the events of the day himself. The old witch studied Crichton for a little while as he poked desperately at the device in front of him, and then frowned in disapproval at what she saw on his face. From some pocket or another in her ratty garment, she withdrew a small black uh, squeeze bulb mm. and dropped it on the table in front of the traumatized human. Dargo had no doubt it contained one of her noxious powders, probably the one she'd been giving to him to make him forget about Eren. Of all the felling stupid things to do, Eren had been furious when she found out just how serious John had been about trying to break it off with her. But John barely gave it a glance, just batted it away with the back of his hand. The blow lacked force, and the bulb sat in the middle of the table, forcing everyone to pretend not to see it. If they could just get John to unwind even a little... Grolak halfway to his mouth, Dargo had an idea. He got up and stalked across the room and grabbed a bottle of fellip nectar. Mm. He hesitated for just a moment and then walked back to the table and set the bottle down in front of Crichton. Drink, he ordered. No thanks, Dee, John said without looking up from the computer screen. Drink! Wow. <laughs> Dargo repeated, sorry, <laughs> I just started doing a... Yeah, you've got a father Jack there. Yeah. <laughs> Drink! Drink! I might, I might have to do Dargo like this for the rest oh, of the year. Oh, yes, let's do Oh, I've got one, I've got one. Philip Nectar! <laughs> I'm still on this frelling island. Still on this frelling ship. Uh, still a frelling fugitive. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, uh, let's see, where were we? You're wound up tighter than the gull at Quillen. Sorry. Yes, that won't help, Aaron. John stopped what he was doing and actually looked Dargo in the eye. I can't, he said softly. I've got to keep a clear head. It's all I've got. It's one frilling drink, John. It won't affect your judgment. Yes, it does, Dargo. No matter what you think at the time, it always does. That's why they have designated drivers. And, and then he... That's pilot. <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, and then he back. Okay, now I'm just thinking about like, you know how Moya sort of redigests some of the waste material that's been described right. in one of the previous fictions. Yeah. So, the second hand drinking is yeah. where I'm, is where I'm sort of going. Okay. Like, you know, hmm. all right, okay, yes, okay. Now so it goes by a Moya, and she's got like a she's got some tolerance. Y yeah, and yes, probably no stuff we're not supposed to talk about because I think we made a deal about the one thing that we're not going to talk about on <laughs> oh the Oh my god, wow, good memory. <laughs> okay, there's native drivers. And then he backed down slightly and offered a compromise. If there's any of that Nexa juice left, I'll have some of that. It wasn't an intoxicant, but at least it would get something into his stomach. I'll get it, Shana said, and popping up and rushing across the room. Out of the corner of his eye, Dargo saw a splash saw her splash some Razlek into the glass mm. with the juice before bringing it over to the table. 
He kept his mouth shut and hoped she hadn't overdone it. Crichton took it absently and went back to his computer search. The rest of them continued to eat, but John's muttered curses suggested he wasn't having much success. From time to time, he took a gulp of the raslac laced juice, eventually polishing off the glass. Obviously frustrated, Crichton turned the computer interface upside down on the table and stared around the room, eyes lighting on everything and nothing. Finally, he got up and walked around the table and parked himself behind Sikozu, all eyes following him. Dargo was seated across the table from the red-headed Kalish and so could see both her face and John behind her. An expression of concern crossed her face, and without turning her head, she slid her eyes to the left to exchange a glance with the frilling Scarron half-breed. Scorpius' ah. expression was serene, and she apparently took her cue from that and simply waited. Why do would... You... Yeah, do you think Scorpius would take his meals with the crew? Who? I don't know. I mean, I guess he... Does he eat as normal people do? Have we ever seen him eat... Well, he's definitely eaten a bit of John's brain. Oh, that was that, That he yes. seems to really, really Savor, enjoy. Yes. I'm, only, I'm more concerned like what, about the choice of words here, well, mm -hmm. because uh, a frilling scarron half-breed... Oh, of course, it's set from Dargo's... Uh, it's written from Dargo's point of view, not from Sakosa's. Right, yeah, yes. That makes yeah. sense, yeah. I was going to say, like, I didn't think that Sakosa would think of Scorpi as a frilling scarron half-breed. She seems much too infatuated with him. Yeah, so, yeah. But from Dargo's point of view, I can uh, I can see that. John took a breath. In a deceptively calm voice, he said, Okay, sicko, tell me. Tell you what? Sikosu asked, apparently keeping her temper with great effort. What did they pay you, huh? The Scarrens. He leaned over her shoulder menacingly. She turned her head and glared at him. Crichton, I know you're upset about Erin, but I had nothing to do with what happened to her. No? You were the last one with her, he said, beginning to tick off his suspicions on his fingers. You knew what that... Okay, I'm... You know what that fucking thing was. We're going to beep it out anyway. Don't worry about it. <laughs> the, still, that it's in there is kind I of know, a big right? deal. Yeah. Um, apparently, the translator microbes have just been winging it so far. Mm. The Kalish opened her mouth to say something, but Chiana must have overdone it with the Raslak because John kept right on talking. And you're pretty damn cozy with Grasshopper here, too, he said, pointing at Scorpius, who gazed back in wide-eyed innocence. <laughs> yeah. Scorpius despises Scarrens. If I'm in league with him, why would I give Aaron to them? Chiana interrupted. She has a point, Crichton. The human turned his attention to the Nabari. Can it, Chi? He said coldly. Oof. You flew all the way back here with that thing. How come you didn't recognize it wasn't Aaron, huh? Tell me that. You're supposed to be your friend. Dargo suggest suspected Chiana had been wondering the same thing, because although she glared at Crichton, she didn't even try to defend herself. Taking a deep breath, John rounded on Sokozu again, apparently determined to get her to confess. You ran off and left her with two Scarrens, goddammit. Two! What do you expect me to think, huh? She told me to, Sikosu shouted back. She's a peacekeeper. Where is she? He bellowed, face flushed deep red with anger and frustration. You tell me right now before I pull an arm or two off. Ah. With that, he grabbed Sikosu by one arm and yanked her sideways out of her chair, no doubt more for emphasis than mayhem. But he must have had a solid grip on her arm because the red had winced in pain. I mean, this is kind of like throwing all of John's tactic to not show to... Uh Scorpius, how much he cares about Aaron into the Out wind. the window, yeah. yeah. So, but it's an interesting premise for a story. Anyway, ah, frel, 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 frel. Oh, now you can do frel. Okay. <laughs> Though Dargo was moving even before Crichton actually touched the Kalish, Scorpius was closer and furious. Mm. He was out of his seat and had thrown the human across the room with a loud growl before anyone knew what was happening. Crichton fetched up against the wall, is that it? Okay, I Not suppose. Not familiar with, no. so we learn. Crichton fetched up against the wall with a thud and a grunt, and Scorpius stood glaring at him. The human glared back, but said nothing. Furious himself, Dargo reached his friend in a few long strides and grabbed him by the arm, pulling him to his feet. Get him out of here. Oh, sorry, sorry. Get him out of here, Scorpius spat. The Luxon wasn't about to dignify that with a comment, and besides, he wasn't sure I'm he could to... actually speak to John without yelling. He simply dragged Crichton into the corridor. Do you think you can spit while inhaling? No. No, it's tricky, right? It's even like, even through your nose and then out of your mouth is almost impossible. Yeah. 
No, no, it's slow. No, sorry. Listeners at home, why don't you try that and then record it and then press delete and, and then, don't send it to us. Yes, and try, to lick, and try, try to lick your elbow. Please. Oh, God. <laughs> Only your own. Nobody else's elbow with, con- with That's unless, easy. except for consent. I don't know. Have you just tried to <laughs> just as a sort of greeting maneuver, <laughs> ignoring consent, just gone straight into trying to lick someone's elbow? No, I suspect there's a high chance of getting uh, elbowed in the face it's if you really do that. Really risky, yeah. yeah. Even like, if even if they don't mean to do it, I mean it's probably just something of a reflex that would happen quite often. It's so like no. giving a cat a third belly rub. Ooh, like well, ooh. It depends on the cat. My old cat used to love belly rubs. Oh, she was just like, oh yeah, d- yeah, belly rubs, please. <sighs> All right, I should have listened to Gianna, Dargo growled, pulling up to his full height so he towered over his friend. She said to let you stew in your own juices. That wasn't exactly what she'd said, but it was close enough considering how angry he was with John for nearly getting himself killed by taking his frustration out on the one person. Edit, edit, edit. Sorry, there was... I was, I was, I was going to say, why did I hear a window yeah. sound? <laughs> edit, edit, edit. I'm going to take it from the top. I should have listened to Gianna. Dargo growled, pulling up to his full height so he towered over his friend. She said to let you stew in your own juices. That wasn't exactly what she'd said, but it was close enough, considering how angry he was with John, for nearly getting himself killed by taking his frustration out on the one person Scorpius seemed to genuinely care about, nauseating as the thought was. Uh, You should have listened to me, Dargo. I told you to leave me out of the frell alone. The two men glared at each other for long... Excuse me. Edit. 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 The two men glared at each other for long microts, and then Crichton deflated. You shouldn't have left China spike my juice. I told you I needed a clear head. Oh, so now it's my fault you were acting like a dranit. Crichton sighed. No, no, it's my fault. It's all my fault. It's always my fault. Mm-hmm. He pressed the heels of his hands into his eyes for a moment, then dragged his hands down the side of his face to his chin, finally dropping them back to his side. I should have let her come with us. She wanted to come with us. Help me keep an eye on Scorpy. Dargo started to interrupt, but John cut him off. Mm. Or better yet, we should have both stayed here, watched TV, ate popcorn like normal people. But I told her she had to look after the girls. He stayed, stared at Dargo with that haunted look again and repeated, I told her she had to look after the girls. No. Oh. Yeah, they did bring back a huge amount of pre-popped popcorn. Right. Are oh, you right? Like a, a bin bag full of already already popped popcorn. That doesn't keep very well. It's much better to keep unpopped popcorn because I can, I'm sure that like you can pop that on. Yeah, oils and heat and yeah, that's easy enough. Yeah, and then you flavor it with whatever you got lying. So around. I'm pretty sure they have salt on Moya. Oh, yeah. oh God, yeah. If they don't, then all my sort of fantasies of living aboard Moya are out the window because <laughs> I don't think that. Oh. oh, come on, salt is like common. I mean. Yeah. I mean, you'd think so, that they have, like, oceans on other planets. Maybe, maybe they... I mean, I mean, we obviously don't know. No, but, like, if John can live there and you need salt oh, to live... Oh, that's a good point, yeah. Then there must be some degree of salt in the diet, because you can't right. essentially live without, I don't think. Mm, it's one of those things, like, you know, like selenium or whatever it was. was that oh, yeah, that, that you need, like... And, yeah, yeah. And ever since we started using shampoo, that's not a problem, because... Yeah, it's a, like it's 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 part of a foaming agent. So the amount of selenium that you just get through your skin by occasionally shampooing your hair is enough to do you for a year. Yeah, that's insane. Human bodies are weird. Anyway, hey, um, all bodies are weird. I think. Fair. Dave Elsie has has gone out of his way to demonstrate that. Very good point, and it's very skillfully too. I might say so. Right. <laughs> oh. Oh, Frell. Dargo muttered several ancient Luxon curses under his breath. Why do they have to be ancient? Come yeah. up with new curses. I was say, modern curses are generally much more creative than ancient ones. <laughs> uh-huh. John, you and Aaron, you didn't break it off, did you? You were back together. That said, John off again. What? Like it would hurt less if we weren't together? I love her, Dargo. I've never stopped loving her, and I won't stop loving her if... He broke off and turned away to see so Dargo couldn't see his face. I just can't stop, I just can't stop loving you, I just can't stop loving you. I wish I could quit you. <laughs> oh, oh, my heart. Uh, speaking of Brokeback Mountain, Dargo <laughs> stared at his best friend. <laughs> 
I'm wondering. I didn't completely read this, <laughs> this, this fanfic. Maybe it goes off in that one direction. Ignoring the slight shake to Crichton's shoulders. He knew the human and the ex-peacekeeper were bound together in a way he couldn't begin to understand. But still, you lie to me, Darko said, giving his friends back a not so shen- jo- Edit, edit, edit. Giving his friends back a not so gentle shove. First the frelling drugs, now this. You lie to me. John whirled around, fire in his eyes instead of the tears he blinked away. Yeah, I lied to you. You betcha. And I lied to Erin, too, most of the time, since she came back. I lied to everyone. Fine. That makes me an A1 grade A bastard. You happy? Okay. So he hadn't been played for a fool by his best friend for the entire time, anyway. If Crichton had been lying to Erin, too, some sympathy began to seep into the Luxon's mind, softening his anger, and he began, John... But Crichton cut him off, that pained look back on his face. Dargo, please, just help me find her. I've got to get her back and the baby. His voice cracked on the last word. Oh, this is really good stuff, by the way. It is. I know we don't uh, interrupt our stories as often to sort of compliment the author, but I'm really enjoying this. (laughs) Dargo sighed heavily. He understood the desperation he saw in the human's eyes. How irrational had he been in his ill-fated quest to track down his son? He shuddered. Oh. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's... A fair bit. <laughs> there are some parallels, which I'm sure have informed, like, his decision-making here. Mm. Why he's such a, an excellent choice for captain. He shuddered to think how he would have been had he been searching for Lolan as well. He laid his hand on John's shoulder and said gruffly, I told you already, John, back on command. We're going to find her. But you have got to pull yourself together. You need to eat, he said taking off his thoughts. You need to let Pilot do his job without badgering him. And you need to stop pointing fingers, not at yourself, not at Sikosu. John had the grace to look embarrassed. Mm. Yeah, man, I guess I should have gotten physical, but damn it, there was something about her, and those were fair questions. Dargo shook his head. I don't trust her exactly either, but I do not believe she betrayed Aaron, and we cannot afford to alienate her. She was with Aaron more than Chiana or Naranti were. She may have seen something that she hasn't realized is important. Crichton snorted slightly, apparently amused with the idea of the over-educated Kalish being unaware that she knew something relevant. <laughs> Come on, I'll go apologize to Miss Britannica for going Neanderthal, and I'll eat something. How bad is that, Stu? Pretty bad, Dargo told him. <laughs> Relieved that John had unwound enough to think of something beside his missing mate, even if he didn't sound very sincere about the apology. The Grolak kind of masks the flavor, though, he added with half a smile. The human grimaced, but headed back towards the center chamber to apologize and find the interrupted meal. Under the circumstances, Dargo counted that a victory. Oh, no. well done. Yeah, that's a good story. Yeah, I like this kind of thing. Also, I like food in Farscape. Just oh, anything yes. Anything involving oh. a meal... Yeah, well, food is amazing. You know, I like food. I like. I do it daily. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah, you're even more of a... You're much more of a gourmand than I am, and also a cook. Well, I mean, you, you have a few recipes that you uh, make very well. and you, because Thank you, you. You, you. Because you dedicate yourself to perfecting something. I cook everything. I'll just, like, I'll follow a recipe and I'll apply my general knowledge, but you are much more dedicated to, like catching on to something that holds your fascination and then just, like, cooking it many times until you get it absolutely right. Yeah. And, like, growing it over time. And, yeah, that's, like, something that I really appreciate as well. That's actually something that a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of high-end chefs do. It's like, they keep cooking that one thing again and again and again. And I'm just like, oh, let's try this now. Oh, let's try that now. So it's a different approach. Well, um, but thank you. (laughs) I wonder how you... How do you think you'd get on if you were on on Moya? Faced with like oh. new ingredients that you were completely unfamiliar with. Oh, ooh, interesting. I don't know. I probably wouldn't do that well because that's mm-hmm. not my style of cooking. I know I like to when I when I get a recipe, I'll, I'll I tend to follow it except when I know for a fact that they're doing something in the way that you shouldn't. Like, you know, adding, right, adding, yeah. adding ingredients in the wrong order because they don't work, uh, because it doesn't work very well. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm not very good at deciding what goes with what. I mean, coming up with new combinations. Oh, interesting. That's like, that's much more Fox Sands thing. I'm much more about like, yeah, he, I always tell him like, fo- you have to follow the recipe and don't like... Your boyfriend. Go- yes, sorry, my boyfriend. Yes. following our <laughs> sort of local psychodramas at home. <laughs> yeah, so I always I tell him like... there's like meal kits 
Like if you go to the Commerce Planet and you can get, like, essentially... Oh, yeah, that would work fine. Like... Okay, okay. What? It's not Hello Fresh. No. It's Frello Hetch. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wow, that's a great spoon. Noise. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right, everybody have a think about what would be in your Frello Hetch <laughs> meal kit that we could cook. <laughs> we'll see you again next week with season four, episode 17. Which one is that again? Well, I think it's a constellation of doubt. Yes, I'm pretty sure it's a constellation of doubt. I'm a good, good Farscape boy. I'm Kaki. I'm Kay. So Farscape. Oh, no. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye.